Good afternoon, uh, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome, of course, to this. I'm Cristina Cafara. Um, I uh, uh, need to uh, send apologies on behalf of my usual co-host, Tomas Valletti, in this endeavor, who is traveling today. This is the competition research policy of CEPR, which is where we aim to connect really academe and policy making, and in particular connect areas of economics and policy which should not be siloed especially in the current political economy. So we have antitrust policy, but we have industrial policy, we have trade policy, digital policy, growth, innovation policy, and so on. It all links together, is my contention. And yet the experience of these policy areas today in many places is that they're quite separate and distinct. And so much that people have been asking me, in fact, how are you hosting a discussion on trade in a competition antitrust environment. So there could be no better people than the people speaking here today, really to explain why they should not, uh, that we should not see trade uh, 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 and competition and antitrust uh, as isolated pursuits, only of interest to trade specialists and macroeconomists. And in fact, uh, as essential to creating economic opportunities, produce inequality, ultimately protect competition together with industrial policy, together with competition policy. So on this note, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a brief framing and then of course hand over to the speakers, it's, it's really worth remembering that, that antitrust has not always been a distinct domain from trade. And in fact, um, it is a, a, a nice coincidence that today, the 22nd of July, is the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of the wrapping up of the Bretton Woods Conference, which was, of course, uh, about many things, but it also affirmed a vision that trade, trade rules should incorporate and embody competition values and protection of workers as essentially a protection against the kind of unsavory relationship that we saw developing between oligarchs and authoritarian regimes in Europe in the 30s and ultimately led to threats to democracy. So this was there. This was part of the vision uh, at the time of the end of the war. This vision has evidently been somewhat lost along the way because of course uh, we became uh, wedded to a notion that ultimately governments should stay out of the way, that corporations know better about free trade, and free trade inevitably incorporates a notion of competition. It's not quite true, because if you don't have guardrails protecting competition and protecting workers, it doesn't naturally kind of happen. It doesn't happen that way, and we've seen the... Uh, the implication of that. It is not necessarily the, the issue of globalization or hyper-globalization being at fault, but it is that the rules that govern uh, trade rules agreements have been losing this kind of focus in some way. So getting to our speakers now, trade is trying to imagine, to figure out what should be the next world order a different version of globalization. We are in a global world, it will remain a global world, but we need a different vision for it, one in which we don't really think that cheap consumer goods are the thing we, we all need desperately uh, uh, to the exclusion of everything else. And, 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 and uh, we need to really reflect on the fact that we have allowed corporate entities a great deal of flexibility on setting the rules that we now operate under and again, the question that we need to ask is, is this good? Is this good for citizens, the world, democracy, and prosperity? And I conclude on this. I think, I feel strongly that the antitrust community should really take a very keen interest in this because we don't have a coherent theory in antitrust alone of how we keep corporate power in check. We cannot do it through antitrust alone. It's requiring a coordinated effort from multiple areas of policy. This is why this discussion is so salient. And so we need to return pro-competition and pro-worker values into trade. 
Now, I'll get out of the way, but I want to really uh, uh, give a warmest welcome to our speaker. I am so thrilled uh, to be able to have them here. These are two people I greatly admire. Um, first, Catherine Tai, of course, they, they, they really need no introduction. Catherine, however, is the US trade representative, and she's been very clear on the need to reimagine some, some of the way in which we do trade for the benefit of prosperity to create greater equality for citizens, for middle classes, not just in the North, but also in the South. And these kind of discourse, Catherine, has pursued and made enormous waves. I mean, at my moment of self publicity, at my uh, my conference last last uh, uh, January, she had a standing ovation for the kind of things that she was saying. So a great uh, moment. But I'm particularly happy to be able to also welcome uh, Simon Johnson. Again, he needs no introduction. Simon is a, a an incredibly distinguished academic. Uh, his latest accomplishment of many is that. Of course, he's co-authored a book which has been celebrated in multiple languages, has been the focus of much attention, power and progress with Darona Chimoglu. And the thing that is remarkable and, and wonderful about that book is the way it tracks the progress of technological progress over, over the centuries and has insights about how we should think about the institutions that allow technological progress to benefit humanity, ultimately, not leaving it to itself. So I'll, I'll stop here, but I'd like to just give the floor first to Catherine uh, with a broad question, but I know that uh, this is something that you thought a lot about. So how do, do we evolve the current trading regime, the trading rules that are prevailing uh, out there, from one that is being reflecting increasingly uh, the benefit, the, the interest of, of large corporations, to one that explicitly allows for workers' rights and uh, competition in a way that ultimately redresses the balance, which is so much, again, at this point, in favor of elite and against citizens ah is there is there is is you are making these points is anyone listening is there a broader possibility for a change and a consensus building around this over to you thank you so much christina it's a delight and an honor to be here with you and with simon um what a uh, what a just a tremendous privilege for me uh, to have this conversation with both of you. Um, I'm uh, going, I, I really appreciate the, the way you've laid out the questions before us, because I think it really puts the focus on where we are today. Um, and in particular, where we are today as it relates to uh, power and as it relates to the people in our societies and our economies um, uh, ordinary people, uh, very much like ourselves. Uh, and I think that the overall diagnosis is that um, we are facing a situation where power, uh, whether it's uh, economic uh, or political, the two are very much related, uh, is very much concentrated and um, over-concentrated. So I know that um, uh, on uh, economics, the antitrust focus uh, very much takes up this issue of concentration and consolidation. Um, coming at it from the trade perspective, um, I would just say that um, from the very beginning of my time as U.S. trade representative, the focus that uh, we have had is to place uh, the worker back at the center of our trade policy. And uh, the reason why is because um, we have seen that the worker has not been at the center for a very long time, and that the worker is fundamentally a human being, um, is uh, one of us. So we'll start there. I also appreciate the fact that uh, you've noted that today is the 80th anniversary of the conclusion of the Bretton Woods Conference, which was so foundational to you. Um, the institutions and the economy globally that we have had uh, for almost a century now. 
But it is also a time to reflect on um, how we got to where we are today and uh, what the first principles were. And here, I take your point about breaking down silos between trade, between antitrust, um, in other areas of economic policy. Uh, but also, for us, it has been about breaking down the barrier of um, time and to take this opportunity to look back at our own history, at what we had come through in the 1930s with respect to the concentration of power. Uh, you very much uh, talked about um, the distortions in um, global geopolitics that came through those types of concentrations of oligarchy, and um, what then uh, was the prescription um, in uh, 1944, and as we were looking at a post-World War II uh, opportunity to remake um, a world order. And what we see is a commitment, as you noted, to um, workers, working people, to uh, the goal of full employment, uh, that this was part of the trade pillar of Bretton Woods, which was originally enshrined in the ITO, the International Trade Organization Charter. Not all of it made it across the finish line, which is why we have to revisit the original vision. Um, what wasn't uh, and still isn't well known is that developing countries, many of them just uh, finding their independence, after long periods of colonialism and colonization, had prominent seats at the table at Bretton Woods. And something else that isn't well known is that that conversation about labor and workers that went into the, inter and the ITO charter originally um, was very much reflecting a concern that the developing countries had. I think on behalf of the United States, the focus was to ensure that in the new economic order that the United States didn't export its employment. Uh, the concern of the developing countries was to protect their workers from exploitation by foreign companies. So I think that that's a really important lens through which to understand that original vision, more comprehensive vision of the ITO charter, that it wasn't simply something that was imposed by a small group of advanced economies, but it was actually a um, coming together of a new world order and um, a set of developing country perspectives transitioning out of an older version of globalization um, that we know as colonialism. Um, the other piece of this is the competition values, the anti-monopoly rules that were reflected in the ITO charter. Now, those did come from the United States and came very directly from FDR himself. And I think that um, that would have come from the reflections of what we had gone through as a world through the 1930s around how monopolies can manifest not just through corporations, but also a concern that monopolies could manifest through entire countries and economies. So those also, those rules didn't make it across the finish line as part of the ITO charter. Something for us to really revisit at this time in history. And I think the overall point is the challenges that we are facing today and I, I think that this is also a theme that comes up in uh, Simon's book. The challenges that we are facing today feel unique and overwhelming. But if we put everything through the lens of history, what we realize is actually none of this is new. We have been presented with similar challenges before, and we have found our way. And the first principle that came out of those times of uh, trouble uh, are tremendously valuable in informing us today around how we might navigate our way and evolve our way to a better future. Thank you. This is wonderful. And I'm so grateful that, again, you picked up on the, on the Bretton Woods uh, uh, anniversary and very much the notion that 
we are at a time in history where somehow we are contemplating questions and problems that some that that we have contemplated before and there was a framing and an attempt to address these problems back then that embodied values and 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 visions that somehow have gotten lost in the last 80 years now let me let me switch to simon simon how did that happen your book of course takes a historic perspective on on uh, technology and evolution of technology, but you also have a focus on, for example, automation as being a major feature of the last 50 years, which has contributed, I, I think, to this loss of focus on these values. Would you elaborate on this? Again, keeping the historical perspective. Yes, absolutely. And, and, I, and thanks for the starting or framing it in terms of history, uh, Christina and Catherine. I think that's absolutely spot on. And remember, at Bretton Woods, there were actually two um, competing visions. One was from the Americans who said, let's have a more open trade system and a post-colonial system, as Catherine said. The other was from the British. Uh, Winston Churchill said, let's go back to having a British empire and, and organizations like that, with trade, of course, running on an imperial basis. Because he had a very different view of the world and the Americans to their credit said no we're not going to do that and and of course the other context is that the, the American the Roosevelt uh, the administration really wanted the US to stay engaged they knew based on the experience after World War one it would be very easy for the US to retreat from the trading system um and, and from the world political system and and they feared what the consequence of that would be politically because of what had happened in World War two and in the 30s but also economically because of the Great Depression um, so I, I think that the the vision there, Christina, was 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 exactly let's build something for everyone. Let's make a relatively open trading system. Let's make it a rules based system so that even the smallest country knows what the rules are. And, and if a big country bullies them or doesn't follow the rules, they can challenge it. Now, that's not a perfect process, but it's worked out remarkably well. And we can find instances of countries that have benefited greatly from that trading uh, system, including um, most of Western Europe in its reconstruction. Japan, I think, did much better uh, after World War II than it would have done otherwise. And we've had some remarkable success stories of up from the ashes, uh, like, uh, for example, South Korea, which is absolutely based on a free, open trading system, follow the rules, and, um, you know, with, with, it, with its imperfections, it can deliver prosperity. I think, Christine, though, the, the right question is, and I think this is where you and Catherine are both going, which is, sort of, where did we go off track? Right. And, and I and I do think the system worked well for a number of decades. We can argue, was it three or two and a half, whatever. And I think it starts to go off track mostly in the 1970s. And we can there's various pieces of that. And, and I think to your point about antitrust being related, Christina, it's really part of this. Well, for want of a better to a Milton Friedman revolution, the free market view, just let the big companies do what they want, let them maximize profits, and that'll be good for society, good for everyone. Well, it turns out it doesn't work on a domestic basis reliably. That's why you have to have antitrust uh, rules, for example. And that's why you have to worry about political lobbying. That's why you have to worry about uh, lots of corruption. But it also doesn't work on, a, on an international level. And as, as Catherine said, the worker was central to the initial American vision for Bretton Woods. And that was a big part of its success. But by the 1970s, or perhaps it's the 1980s, on Ronald Reagan, again, we can discuss that, the worker has drifted out of the limelight. And it's all about what, do, what does big pharma or emerging software companies or media companies, what do they want in the Uruguay round? And what are we willing to give up in terms of protection for textiles, for example, or shoes in the US in order to get what we want, get what those big, um, strong, politically powerful American corporations want internationally. So the corporation at the center and driving, I think, in the Uruguay round, the, the trade process, which had massively unfortunate consequences, including uh, in the way HIV AIDS drugs were treated. And there were some attempts to obviously fix that subsequently. But that's a very, I think, very telling example. And I think Catherine and her colleagues have <laughs> worked really hard under difficult circumstances to drag the discussion back towards the worker. And, and there were plenty of there were other people. I, I, I want to shout out to Sandy Levin, who was um, for a long time the senior Democrat on the House Ways and Means Committee, who worked very long and hard to try and get worker and the environment more central to trade discussions. But there's no question that, that Catherine and her colleagues have really moved us in that direction. It's obviously not a completed task, and we might well go back the other way in, 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 a, in, in a bad way. But, but I think this, this is where we need to be after 80 years of Bretton Woods. 
And, and it is, uh, of course, not a coincidence for somebody who's practiced antitrust that you date back where we went wrong in some way to the 80s, which is where we in the antitrust world have effectively shifted towards a Chicago view, a pro-efficiency view, uh, a notion that monopolies can be good and efficient, and that's why they're monopolies. And that is also the time, I guess, where we in antitrust have completely lost the sight of everything else. We developed this vision that antitrust is a science, it's pure, it doesn't need to look left or right, and anti-monopoly competition values don't, don't somehow have anything to do with trade. So um, I, I second that Catherine is, is a unique voice in, in making these points in the international community. I want to go to the Global South in a moment, Catherine, but how, how do you think these, these effectively, this these vision that you are putting forward, this quest for going back to these values, uh, has it, does it have a prospect of being, of being seen? My impression is that the general trade world is quite distant at this point from this. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm mystified as to why this is. Why have we allowed, why is the trade world in general, other than a few isolated voices, feel as, as separate from these values as antitrust feels from trade? Again, it's a different way of putting the same question, but it is, distressing to me that we're not seeing these links and we're not working towards them. Well, Christina, I think that the experience in the trade community is probably very similar to the experience you've described in the antitrust community in terms of uh, training and a kind of a programming over decades in terms of what the right answer is um, and uh, what the goal should be. What we see in trade is a pursuit of um, more trade, more liberalization, and a disconnect and a divorce from uh, checking our programming and our pursuits against real world, real life outcomes. And this is where um, a lot of our work uh, is really about keeping our eyes open and keeping our minds open. Where, um, you know, to Simon's point about uh, where do we start going off track. I think part of it is where did we start seeing economic outcomes uh, that were not the point of the original rules-based system. The original rules-based system, even in the parts that survived into what's now the World Trade Organization, the WTO, and that founding document, the preamble, it's, it's actually incredibly eloquently articulated, the goals of uh, full employment, raising standards of living, uh, conserving our natural resources, sustainable development goals. Um, so uh, I think, though, uh, Christina, what I would like to share with you through the trade lens, and I'd be willing to bet that this is also true uh, for um, the antitrust community, um, we are making progress. I think that those with truly open minds, with the curiosity to interrogate, to investigate reality, and to revisit assumptions, uh, those who are truly committed to um, optimal economic outcomes, not in terms of statistics, but in terms of the lived experiences, the livelihood opportunities of ordinary working people, um, these connections are being made, and we are making progress to evolving the conversation, which is going to be required in order to evolve the reality. Um, I wanted to revisit for a moment uh, Simon's question about where things start going off track. And I think that um, his point of view is um, incredibly salient, um, and um, uh, I listened carefully to his insights. I just want to connect that back to the original ITO charter and that more holistic, comprehensive vision that included meaningful labor standards and um, anti-monopoly rules, and to reflect on um, those as core principles, but also as safeguards and guardrails that were left behind 
And the question around why they were left behind, why that more comprehensive vision didn't make it across the finish line, just to complete the circle to where Simon started his comments, uh, was because of um, Senator Taft, who was then the chairman of the Labor Committee in the Senate, um, and uh, the lobbying work of trade associations in Washington to leave those pieces behind that then allowed for the distortions that would come later in the decades that followed. So um, just to cap off uh, that discussion, and Christina, to your, to your, um, to your second question, um, I think that we are making progress. And I think it's conversations like the one that you are convening here today uh, that will allow us to make more progress and to break through um, those, uh, those walls of those silos, which I think are becoming more brittle uh, as we see things change around us, whether that's because of technological advances, whether that's because of the increasing obvious urgency of the climate crisis, whether that's because of the supply chain challenges that we have today, the uh, challenges in terms of more equity uh, and to address the inequality that we see growing around the world in our own economies and between economies. Um, I think that um, uh, we are absolutely making progress, but uh, uh, no question, uh, we need more of us making these connections. Wonderful. I have follow-up questions, but before I go there, I'd like to give Simon the opportunity to comment on this. Yeah, so I, I think you're right to keep pushing us, Christina, on trying to unify the antitrust and, and the trade pieces, uh, to which I, I and, and you mentioned, of course, to, to Chicago School, my usual uh, response when that comes up is to quote George Stigler and capture, regulatory capture, and the politics of that, which I think of that point was, was 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 an integral part of the Chicago reasoning, but I think it's it's been lost in the translation to practical policy, um, because th that's what's happened on on the antitrust side. I, I not I'm not speaking about Catherine O'Connor. I'm talking about what came before and what might come after. But powerful co corporation. Where do the rules come from? Who makes the rules? They don't drop from the skies unassisted, mm. right? And as Catherine said, there's a you know there's, there's always a fault in the original DNA, which was already the power of, of the corporations. And, and by the way, that also came out of a, an excessively uh, pro-business Supreme Court in the 1930s, as you know, an issue that was never entirely resolved. It was dormant for a while, but is, is now read its very ugly head again. So I think that the, it's the politics, Christina, and, and many economists, e even though political economy is a vibrant field with, with a lot of really good research, there are many specialist economists on antitrust, I'm afraid to say on trade, who say, well, no, no, we're dealing with more technical issues. Politics is something separate. So I think if right. the politics and the political economy of capture and power is exactly what unifies what's gone wrong in those two fields, I, I would say, I would say, Christina. And, and, I, and I don't need to go, go any further than George Sigler and the Chicago School to explain why, why that is. And then, but then, and then you've got to think about structural changes like breaking up companies, right? because you may not be able to regulate them on a, on a regular basis. And of course, if anyone thinks that monopolies are fine and global monopolies are even better, I presume they don't subscribe to uh, cloud strikes, uh, computer <laughs> systems. The, the dangers of monoculture, Christina. Of have course, just in, in, in the digital fear. age, yeah, they've just slapped us in the face once again. And these slaps in the face, just like with financial crises, slaps in the face from systemic risk should not be ignored. Very true. And, and uh, I, I very much uh, feel strongly that this call for some, some uh, joining the dots, as I keep calling it, uh, are, are overdue. And I keep pushing this, this type of arguments. But let me go back to Catherine. I agree with you, Catherine. Progress is being made. I agree. There are conversations that I witnessed that I find encouraging. What I found particularly uh, elating and a lot of people did in the room was when, when, when again at my conference in January, you were talking about how your vision for how to return trade to certain uh, values really was also embracing a vision of how the global South should be seen in this as a partner. And at the beginning of your comments, you talked about, again, the end of Bretton Woods and it's, 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 it's talked briefly about how some of the drivers there came from not the global north, but 
developing countries. So what I've witnessed uh, quite a bit is you talk about how what you uh, would like to see is, 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 is policy that ultimately is, is benign and beneficial to not just uh, the middle classes and uh, the global north, what you call uh, uh, the, the sort of the, from the middle out, but also has the same benefits to developing countries. And at my conference, you were speaking to the chief economist of the, of the South African Competition Commission, who was emphatically agreeing that this kind of focus on what works for the global South is so overdue. Would you like to expand on that? I'd be delighted to. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a great topic for conversation in terms of organizing my own week uh, because uh, later this week uh, we will be hosting the AGOA Forum, that's the African Growth and Opportunity Act Forum here in Washington D.C., and that is our foundational trade program between the United States and the countries of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, also delighted to be having this conversation uh, with Simon. Um, who has, I know, spent a lot of time uh, thinking about um, these uh, development issues um, in his role as uh, formerly as chief economist of the IMF. I also know that he's edited a multi-volume um, uh, study um, on uh, Africa economic development um, and uh, someone uh, that my team and I have been in touch with as we have worked on our trade and development programs um, and uh, our uh, Africa initiatives in uh, particular. Um, you know, something that became very, very clear when President Biden convened African leaders here in Washington, D.C. in December of 2022 um, is that um, the, the demographic of Africa um, really showing that the future is Africa and our success is actually about the success of the future of Africa and uh, um, our failures uh, will rise and fall. Our, our success and our, our prospects will rise and fall on uh, Africa's development. Uh, the median age um, in Africa, the entire continent right now is 19. By the year 2050, one in four human beings on the planet will be African. Uh, so that's a tremendous amount of potential. And then the question of um, Africa's development then is one that we should be and we are, as an administration, deeply invested in. Then the task comes to us at USTR to um, figure out how do we harness and deploy the tools of trade um, between the United States and the countries of Africa to help to develop that potential for Africa, for the US and Africa, and for the world. Um, here, uh, I think this is something that I know that uh, Simon is also um, uh, very focused on, is uh, Africa's own integration agenda. Um, the uh, agenda by the countries on the continent to economically integrate with each other. Um, after uh, centuries of um, colonization, and the legacy of colonialism, uh, it turns out that the economies in Africa individually are better integrated with countries and economies outside of the continent than they are with each other. And the ability of Africa then to harness its potential really does lie in this ability to become more than a sum of its parts in terms of um, uh, continental integration. And so that's something that is um, informing uh, our approach with respect to trade um, it, through programs like AGOA, which are between the United States and um, a large number of countries, but also informing our approach to uh, individual negotiations like the Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, that uh, we are advancing with Kenya. Uh, now, there, in terms of the Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership, what we're calling shorthand the STIP, uh, we have been very, very thoughtful and intentional about how we build out that trade negotiation. Uh, we are, across all of our trade initiatives, trying to tailor 
our engagement and our negotiations to the particular partner, to the particular relationship, and in the context of the region and um, uh, the the partner and um, uh, its region's uh, aspirations and challenges. And here I wanted to note a couple of the elements of the Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, and highlight um, how they really focus on how we are thinking about trade and development. Christina, to your point, um, the longer I am in this job, uh, the more clearly it is, uh, it is presented to me that this desire to grow the middle class is not, is not a uniquely American one. This middle out economics, not just middle out, but bottom up, um, it's quite universal. It turns out that we are all trying to grow the middle class, to grow economic opportunity at home for our people. And the questions presented, how can we do it together? Instead of pitting our economies, our workers, our middle classes against each other, what is a program that we can advance that allows us to do this at the same time? You know, what's quite interesting is um, here we talk a lot about, in the Biden-Harris administration, middle out, bottom up uh, economics. Um, uh, president Ruto, the president of Kenya, campaigned on a vision of bottom up economics. And I think that, you know, that coincidence in terms of phrasing really speaks volumes to the uh, universality of the, um, the, the policy goal. And so here uh, we inherited uh, what looks like a very traditional free trade agreement program from the previous administration. And when we began our time in this administration, the question that we asked ourselves and our partners in Kenya was, um, what is it we're trying to accomplish in this particular negotiation, in this particular relationship? And uh, what we explored together was, uh, one, uh, the desire on the part of um, a developing country partner, um, all developing countries perhaps, and frankly, I think all economies, for investment, for more investment, to be viewed as a desirable destination for international investment. And uh, a second piece of it was the signal of a trade agreement negotiation with the United States that signal to the market and market participants as a sign of confidence in the economy and its prospects. And then I think there was a third element, which was a desire to be building capacity to take advantage of new economic opportunities at the same time as you are negotiating an initiative. And so we took those elements and through a building blocks approach, which we are taking with all of our partners that we are actively negotiating uh, trade arrangements with, uh, we have started with anti-corruption rules, knowing that uh, corruption is an element that creates a drag on economic development, economic activity and growth. Um, something in trade that we call good regulatory practices, which is about transparency and predictability in terms of the regulatory process, is also an element that we have included because that kind of transparency is building of confidence in uh, an economic system. In addition to that, we know that Strengthening the quality of life and the purchasing power of working people is an important pathway for development. And so we want to make sure that workers are protected against exploitation. Climate change and environmental governance are particularly important for the continent, especially today, for us and for the planet. So we want to make sure that we are working together on environment, conservation, and climate. And then what is so um, uh, beautifully articulated on the continent through the uh, AFCFTA, that's the African Continental Free Trade Area um, Principles, is the um, uh, focus on women and youth in economic development and economic integration uh, in Africa. And so we have also made 
an inclusive economy, an important aspect of what we are negotiating with Kenya. So we want it to reflect the importance of including populations that are very often overlooked in our trade negotiations in these discussions that are so often dominated by large corporate actors in our economies to the exclusion of smaller corporate actors, micro businesses, women, youth, civil society, worker organizations, environmental organizations. And so this is the way that we're approaching our uh, overall uh, engagement with Africa, with this um, uh, uh, integration agenda in mind, and also, even more specifically, how we're approaching our trade negotiations with Kenya. We are tailoring a old, one-size-fits-all free trade agreement approach to this particular partner in a building blocks kind of way so that we can ensure that the outcomes of this partnership are hitting the marks in terms of creating more opportunities for more people in Kenya, but also here in the United States. And uh, I'm really anxious to hear um, thoughts from Simon on this topic as well. Yes, over to you, Simon. I mean, this is amazing. There's so much to unpack in there. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot to unpack. And just to make sure everyone, everyone understands how difficult uh, the job is for, for Catherine and, and her colleagues, let's I'm afraid we have to mention China and China in Africa, which has had a, a really big impact, both in terms of um, the rise of Chinese manufacturing, which was ultra competitive because of the way they handled the exchange rate for a while, which, which took opportunities away from, of course, some parts of the United States, but also from developing countries such as Africa. And then there's the Chinese investment strategy, which has been very focused, of course, on, on mineral extraction. And there is the... Um, let's call it lack of Chinese emphasis on transparency and anti-corruption measures. So it, it's in some sense, I, I, I would say, uh, Catherine doesn't have to weigh in and come back on this, but to you, to you Christina, you know, the, it's antithetical to the, the, the US approach is, let's do rules-based, let's make it transparent. And of course, let's widen it beyond the sectors that are currently trading. So traditional trade agreements focus on who's already in, in, you know, likely to export and so on. But we've learned and then and, and, and Catherine and her team are replying the lesson that the, the broader structure of civil society and power matters a huge amount, including for who can enter into that trading economy, the openness and, 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 and the part of the economy where productivity can, can increase. So I think the, the, the really big gain here is what you said at the beginning, Christina, which was, and, and Catherine mentioned, which is um, the lack of trade within Africa, which is absolutely a colonial legacy that's been perpetuated by policies from, primarily from those colonial powers. So encouraging African countries to trade with each other on a win-win basis, just as the West Europeans did after 1944. So Bretton Woods and those principles had a very direct analogy that played out through um, the Iron and Steel Agreement and then what became the European uh, Common Market. Uh, and, and then of course all the antecedents to the European Union. If Africa can move in that direction, but, but what will be the trading basis? it's much more likely to succeed if they can adopt the kind of principles that, that Catherine was laying out. And you don't expect this to happen overnight. There's always gonna be sensitivities about, okay, I'm gonna gain this, but you're gonna gain more, or some of my industries might lose and I don't feel good about that. So these things take decades, it took decades in Europe, it took decades uh, when things were going well in, in, in the, uh, at the world trading system level. So you expect to take decades in Africa China, I think, is a bit of a spoiler uh, in this and, 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 a, and a complication, to be honest, um, particularly because, again, the politics and, and where, the, where the money flows and what the incentives are for the people who rule these countries. But I'm very glad that the Biden-Harris administration has taken this on. I think it's long overdue. And I think going beyond traditional one-size-fits-all free trade agreements, just make it go free and the companies will take care of it. Well, that's what got us into trouble. That's what got us all this friction around worker rights, around environmental uh, Im impact, and around everything else we've been talking about today. So let's do something different. And it's more than the work of four years, I think, um, it's, for, it's, for anyone. It's 
fantastically interested, interesting, but at the same time, there is a perception, again, uh, things are moving in a positive direction, but there is still kind of a lot of uh, concern that things are moving in a more protectionist way, that the future is going to look more in, as, as trade barriers. And why do we see this contradiction still being put uh, for you know, the U.S. is 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 saying things, but at the same time, it's becoming more protectionist. Isn't that a narrative we hear a lot about? <laughs> there are many narratives out there, Christine. Look, I think that the the the, the if, if I if I if I can have the temerity to summarize the Biden Harris broad policy on this, and Catherine can correct me, I I I really dispute that that what they the, the policy they've proposed or followed including, for example, as articulated through the Chips and Science Act or even the Inflation Reduction Act. I really contest that that's essentially protectionist. I think putting a, a, a big amount of effort into developing your own science, your own technology, your own industry, and sharing that with the world on an equitable basis, that is exactly, that's the positive side of what happened after World War II. Um, I think that um, we neglected industrial strategy in this country. We invented a lot of industries and then handed over the good jobs to the rest of the world. Flat screen TVs, I mean, you can look that one up. We invented that industry twice, and most of those jobs are elsewhere in the world. On the contrary, we did the Human Genome Project, which for various reasons, those jobs have stayed in the US. That was a big federal government investment, a lot of risk, if you like, generates an industry that creates 300,000 jobs and, and produce, gave you things like an effective COVID vaccine. So I think the US regaining its vision of technological leadership is not protectionist, particularly when accompanied by and, and emphasized by Catherine and, and her colleagues policy at the USTR. I think agreeing to trade with people on, on a rules basis, a rules, on a rules, in a rules based system where you're allowing opportunity and entry, right? So here's your competition point, Christina. Catherine said we, they, they, they want to get um, all these overlooked people into that system because if they're in that system on a rules based, following the rules based principles, they're not, they're less likely to be exploited, they're more likely to get an improvement in their standard of living, and there's less likely to be environmental damage and, and other negative spillovers. So I think that's a very coherent vision. I don't think that's protectionist, Christina. I think that's leading with your strengths and encouraging other people to trade with you on a win win basis. That's what we did successfully for three decades after World War Two, and we stopped doing that after the 1970s and 80s. And I, I'm very grateful to Catherine and her colleagues for bringing us back Wonderful. towards that direction. Wonderful. This is exactly uh, what I was hoping you'd say, because I think I think uh, I, I share that view, but it needs to be articulated in, in that way. Um, let me, uh, as we, we, you know, we are circling back to the competition point, uh, I want to uh, go into, into, into technology and, and perhaps end the discussion in that space. One of the, one of the uh, areas, Catherine, where you've been uh, uh, certainly vocal uh, and taken a position is the area of digital trade, for example, in which uh, you have stated a position that I'll let you articulate, but essentially was perceived as, as, as inevitably by, by big tech as being antagonistic and being a barrier to trade. And uh, when uh, what you were saying, uh, and I'll let you explain it, it's uh, I need to just align trade with, again, anti-monopoly values that are being pursued at home by the administration. And this is an episode, an example of uh, the many things you've been pushing forward, which I think illustrates beautifully the way in which you are moving the thinking. Will you elaborate on that? I'd be delighted to, Christina, and I think in this area, when it comes to what we call digital trade and uh, the intersection of uh, trade rules and um, uh, where we are uh, in technology and technology advancement today, um, so much of the conversation and so much of the position that um, <clears throat> we've taken in this administration at USTR has been mischaracterized and has been made quite uh, a, a straw man. Uh, argument. So we start with first principles, which is that um, uh, we are all about uh, growing our economy, the United States economy, and our middle class. We are about uh, working together with others in the spirit of FDR and um, uh, the Biden-Harris administration in America being back and engaged with the rest of the world affirmatively 
and positively. Um, we are about negotiating trade rules. Rule-based order is still very much our rock and our foundation. I think the challenge with existing rules is um, they are showing their age, especially in light of uh, the emergence and the dominance of China as an economy, as a global monopolistic player uh, in the world economy, um, but also in terms of looking at um, the changes that are happening and uh, the struggle to articulate new rules. And I think that this is where we need to be extremely thoughtful, how we remain committed to being engaged with our trading partners in the various forums, whether bilateral and small groups at the WTO, which is the multilateral trading system. How do we stay engaged while staying apprised us of understanding what we are negotiating? and what we should be negotiating, what the implications are going to be. And I think that here is where I really want to take the pause to say that in our digital trade negotiations, what I have encountered is very, very strong programming around a liberalization program that is being analogized in the technology area, especially with respect to the um, issue of data, which it turns out is not just some kind of lubricant for allowing for traditional global goods transactions, but has become the game itself. And if you look at the development of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is built on the aggregation of massive amounts of data that has been accumulated cost-free, <laughs> freely, by these very, very large dominant players in our economy. And so this, this should cause us to really think through what it is we are negotiating, what we should be asking for, what we should be aiming for, what the positive implications should be, how to avoid negative implications. And I think on this one in particular, what I really want to emphasize, which I think is a value that really comes out in Simon's work and is a large part of our conversation today, is bringing it all back to the human being, to our people, and ensuring that um, the power to make choices as workers, as consumers, um, uh, as uh, people in a democracy, uh, is retained by our fellow citizens in our society. And so um, I wanted to highlight just a couple elements in terms of the AI conversation. First, um, the relevance to the aggregation of data. Um, second, um, the impact on uh, people. Uh, the impact on people as creative and creators. Um, I recently had a conversation with a coalition of uh, creators and workers in the creative industries, really sounding the alarm that there are AI international conversations and uh, arrangements that are being shaped right now um, without due respect to copyright and the rights of creators. And uh, we just take a look around us in terms of the, um, the legal landscape here in the United States to um, some very famous uh, actors, um, uh, artists, um, even um, uh, journalism uh, organizations that are seeking compensation from the AI companies for uh, the product of their uh, intellect and creativity that have been um, uh, cannibalized by these AI companies for massive profit. And I, I think one other strand that I want to pull on here is in terms of the impact of artificial intelligence and um, the human experience is also this issue of algorithms and um, the 
bias, because the algorithms are created by people, the bias that can be baked into these algorithms that can perpetuate discrimination, inequality, and prejudice. And I think this all goes back to a central theme that as we navigate our way through the transformations that are happening in our economy and the global economy today, that we have to just keep the central focal point of our values and our policy consciousness around the experience of our fellow human beings. Wonderful. Let me hand over to Simon. I know you've uh, thought about AI a lot on the back of the, the insights of your book. And uh, so this is a perfect point for you to jump in, Simon. Go ahead. Well, just very quickly, Christina, because we're running short on time, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with what Catherine said and, and the policies they're pursuing. I think AI is incredibly dangerous if it becomes a monopoly, either in the form of one or two companies, or even one model or one way of thinking, and, and um, the 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 crowd strike experience on Friday again, it, it just a, that's just a wake up call to to what to how this can become global and, and really intensely wrong. At the same time, there is opportunity here. AI can be applied to deal with really fundamental difficult problems, including in poorer countries, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in parts of Africa, for example. But who's going to take the lead on that? Where, where's the money? Uh, where's the market? Who's going to pay for that? There's a lot of opportunities for American leadership here. And, and pushing people to properly protect and be compensated for their data is incredibly important as a foundational principle here. In addition, what that, how that data is used and the way in which that data either strengthens civil society or undermines it, that's also going to be part of the conversation. But I think that the antitrust piece ties up with protection of property rights, protection of, of creative rights. And, and I think people are beginning to wake up to the fact that these AI companies have taken too much and have paid too little and faced too, too few constraints from society, despite the fact that we're using our data. So embedding this in digital trade uh, now is, in, is, is very far-sighted and, and, and absolutely should be supported. Of course, it's an emergent field. We'll, we'll, We'll see what happens. And, and I am sure that big tech is fighting you every inch of the way, Catherine. So um, I really <laughs> hope that, that, that you and your colleagues uh, prevail and, and make that progress and, and that we all learn these lessons that back to the antitrust point, if anybody gets too powerful in, in our economy, Christina, it's damaging for us as consumers, that traditional antitrust as it played out past 100 years. It's damaging for us as taxpayers, it turns out, because they rip us off in various other ways. It's damaging, it turns out, for us as citizens, because a lot of these big tech guys, we've learned quite recently, are not so keen on the right to vote or the right to have proper choice in the electoral sphere. Uh, that would not be a shock to Teddy Roosevelt, by the way. He saw the anti, he saw the, the robber barons for what they were in democratic senses. But again, antitrust drifted a little bit away from that. So it's incredibly dangerous to let billionaires of any kind become too powerful. But the tech industry and its global reach and the appeal of AI and, and some of the promise of AI and some, some of the reality of AI is incredibly dangerous, but there's also promise. If we can get it into a rules-based framework and if we can agree on that between um, willing partners of trade. Wonderful. What a wonderful sort of note to end on. I think, as you say, we are exactly at time. I, uh, I, I, I want to just tee up briefly this notion that it is so salient and important that we have these conversations across areas of, 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 of policy because uh, we are making progress. It's true, Catherine, and we need to make more in integrating perspectives. The fight against power is not gonna be won by antitrust alone. It needs to be fought through other instruments as well. And I plead to the people, uh, and the hundreds of people listening today, not to just silo on one discipline. But let me just uh, end by saying, I'm aware that there were many questions in the chat that I won't have time to go through. Many were uh, questions that are difficult to answer, such as what will happen? We don't know what will happen and what the world will look like in six months, but I'm grateful to the audience, of course, for having engaged and having put uh, those questions. I'll make sure that Simon and Catherine see them. Uh, we don't have time to really uh, go through them. But above all, I want to thank Catherine and Simon for the amazing conversation. This was incredibly elating and we are so privileged to have you. Uh, thanks again. We are very grateful. Thank you.